Bom dia, bom dia. Ni hao. Iniziamo questa ultima mattinata, iniziamo questa ultima mattinata di studio, sempre con il canto che ha la nostra vera, Marta Vera. Iniziamo. Y regresó a su momento donde las madres estaban muy preocupadas por ella porque no sabía de su celda. Entonces, ella les cuenta.
voy a presentar a un amigo que conocí, Reverend Malcolm Newland, y voy a empezar a hablar en inglés porque él va a hacer su, um, su conferencia en inglés. Um, y bueno, lo conocí por otra diocidencia. Yo estaba manejando, regreso a mi casa en el paso de Austin, Texas, que es un camino bien largo, y recibo una llamada de una enfermera que se llama Molly, Molly Thomas, que por cierto, Sor María le hizo a ella un, uh, un milagro. Uh, me llama y me dice, ¿tú eres la que estudias a Sor María de Jesús? Le dije, sí. Dije, y dijo, uh, bueno, el doctor con que yo trabajo, el doctor um, uh, Roland, ay, ya se me olvidó su nombre, no lo tengo en la mente right now, pero um, él me dijo que te llamara y te dijera que le llamaras a él. Llamándole a él, me dice, hay un Monseñor en Lubbock, Texas, que dice que ha visto grabados de Sor María de Jesús en, en la piedra. Y no sé dónde está, pero le puedes llamar a mi hermano que trabaja en Texas Tech. Es profesor de medicina. Le llamo al hermano y me dice, no, pues él es capellán en Texas Tech. Y bueno, le hablé, hablé a la oficina de, de los capellanes y me dicen, no, él ya se retiró, ya no es padre. Entonces, ok, ¿cómo lo puedo encontrar? Y dijeron, tenemos que, uh, que tenemos su número, así que le puedes llamar. Entonces le llamo a Malcolm Nyland. Y um, que ya tiene otra vida ahora de esposo con, con Peggy Nyland. Y fue una experiencia muy interesante porque me empieza a hablar de lo que él ha visto. Y quería que fuera a ver, a ver si esos grabados eran... Sor María. So I'm going to start in English. Uh, Malcolm Nyland is the president and executive director of the National Exhibits Association, a nonprofit organization which is founded in 1999 after 12 years of diligent planning and support, uh, gathering before reading the association's first exhibit of the Vatican art in 2002. Um, he was ordained a Catholic priest and was a priest for 48 years and pastor of many parishes for 34 years. He also serves as associate chaplain in the pastoral care department of the University Medical Center. He holds academic degrees in behavioral science, philosophy, theology, masters of divinity, and both uh, baccalaureate and master's degree in canon law and is also a doctor of jurisprudence. He served on the board of the International Cultural Center for the Texas Tech University and is a lifetime patron of the arts for the Vatican exhibits, museums, and a member of the Equestrian Order of the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem. He is also judicial vicar, or was judicial vicar, of the Diocese of Lubbock for 14 years and a member of the College of Cons Consultors. Uh, the personal board as the vocations director of the Diocese of Lubbock. And now I would like to present uh, Malcolm Neeland, who has studied scientifically archaeology, paleontology, Photogeology. Whoa. <laughs> Good morning. Wow. I'm really very humble in the sense that Humility is not something you would say that you are yourself. 
But deep in my corazón, in my heart, I am very uh, humbled and pleased that I would be able to share something very small, maybe it doesn't seem important, but we are hoping and praying that this will bring us closer to what we already know uh, is a saint. Okay. All right. My story begins quite simply. I was pastor of the church in Post, Texas. It happened to be called Holy Cross. It just now dawned on me. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, there, uh, we were a mission diocese. Uh, still are. <laughs> and there are a lot of Native Americans who have passed through our area off the Cap Rock, the Lano Estacado, it's called. And it was visited by Yumano and by Kawa, Kawa Apache, and the dreaded Comanches. We always say dreaded because they did a little damage <laughs> toward the end. But I'm taking you back to the time that the Yumanos were there. Uh, they were very humble, very small group of people always were but they were by the word by their name it means that they're they're like a, a large group there's no segments of groups so to speak all tribal areas uh, they would interrelate to one another as indians who would follow the buffalo they would follow the buffalo from north to south and then back from south to north as the seasons would change. They would then bring their skins and that uh, over into what is now New Mexico, New Mexico, and trade with the Pueblos. And they would trade maybe for a pot or a pottery or something. But they were a very uh, humble people. I mean, they, they really didn't really belong in the beginning to the Puebloan people. Uh, they were just kind of seen as outsiders in the very beginning. So one day I was doing some paleontology work uh, that has nothing to do with archaeology. <laughs> but I was doing some paleontology work on a ranch, a ranchero, uh, that belonged to a very dear friend of mine. Uh, he had like 40 48 sections, so it wasn't too small. And I came across an alcove along the North Fork of the Brazos River, which cut through that area. And in that alcove were pectoliths. And those pectoliths were very basic, very simple ones. So I got a geologist and some other people to look at it. And the only thing we could figure out was that there was one image that did not look like it was an ordinary type image. Okay. So that curiosity. So I was very curious and I asked a couple of other people to look at it. And the best they could tell was that it was probably around the 1500s 1600, somewhere in that area. Uh, they do that by, the, <laughs> the carvings were in extremely hard, but dateable, uh, sand, uh, sand type of stone. This image was unusual, very simple. Circle, and two lines coming from the bottom of the circle, coming out like that. I found out later that that was how the Yumanos represented a lady. Okay, so that piqued my curiosity even more. So as the years went on, and I'm saying years, so two years went by, because I was pastor then of poor parishes. You know, we have a very shortage of priests there. So. Uh, but I did get back around to go out once in a while for my hobby. I related to a person 
who I invited out to look at it. She's standing at my left. <laughs> if she'll come out a bit. <laughs> okay. I invited her to come to Lubbock from El Paso. And a small group of us went out to the site. They were all excited about it and thought it was very unusual. But this lady here says, Padre, guess what? I said, what? There's another image just like that, a little bit north of San Angelo. And I'm going, wow. You know, it's, it's kind of a, I think you're trying, to, you're trying to get a picture, I guess, or something. Yes. But, and that even picked my curiosity even more. So I started reading about the City of God and some of the other books that Maria did because, if I'm not mistaken, humanos just do not put women on in their pectoclips. <laughs> So it must have been something fantastic and extremely unusual for them to do that. So uh, I started reading, and then I read about a friar Benavides that he had gone to Spain and interviewed uh, a sister there. And in that interview, it seemed to indicate that she appeared to them, or she appeared to them, uh, by, by, by location, uh, and taught them a little bit, uh, uh, as much as she could, I'm sure, about Christianity. So their first introduction to Christianity in our area, uh, where I live in my diocese, and uh, in my state of Northwest Texas, uh, I was even more curious about finding more. I was told by two Native Americans, and I have given, they will have that name and contact, contact number, uh, who were also Native Americans who told me that the elders, the older people, were telling stories about how they met this lady who was dressed in blue and who told them after she Christianized them, uh, that in their story, they said that she didn't speak their language, but she understood her, what she was saying. And she understood what they were saying. That was kind of interesting. So the next stage we move along, it was very simple. I listened to the elders, and they said that this lady had asked them to make a cross and to weave that cross and go north. Well, now, right now we are uh, probably between San Angelo and where the site is, the Pectic Lips. Okay. Now, they were to go north and then they were to go west and put the cross there in. I guess I, I think we ended up thinking that it was uh, Avo, Avo was the name of the uh, ruins today. And they were to leave it there. And their story ended there. Well, you know, I finally got a chance to get loose and I, I drove to New Mexico and I went out to the Mission Avo and I'm not, not too sure what I was looking for. But I went out there and I eventually did find in the a Pueblo ruin next to the ruin today of Abo. And it's a small area. And I was just digging around because archaeology is something that always fascinated me. And I had permission to be there, thank goodness. That was even better. <laughs> and so uh, I found uh, this cross. And it was woven out of yucca strands. Now you can take a yucca deal and peel it off. And it looked like, at first I thought I found a basket, you know. And so I just gently took it out and it was in the form of a cross. So, well, curiosity uh, ended there because I'm going, this is getting, I'm, I'm nervous, this is getting bad. I, I don't know how to explain any of this to anyone and if I did, they wouldn't believe me anyway. 
Jesus. But what do I do? Well, I found out and took that cross uh, that I found. And I had an archaeology friend of mine that was at Texas Tech University or department and gave it to them to say, well, can you give me an idea maybe how old this is? Because I was finding on top of the, this overhang, on the top of the mesa, a lot of artifacts. A lot of artifacts. And it ends up they were being Yamano-type artifacts. So that's how we, the archaeologists decided it had to be a summer camp and a winter camp. So they'd been back and forth a lot there. The date that was given, they said it was hard to do, but they couldn't do it, but they had to go out. So I go take them out there and they took them on the side of the sandstone or whatever it is, the alcove stuff there. And that's how so we kind of got the idea, 1600s, 1500s, something like that. I then, with my naivete, and I really mean I'm naivete, <laughs> uh, now what do I do? Well, I gave it to the archaeologists at Texas Tech University and told them, and then gave them the archaeology department here in Rome at the Vatican, or the Vatican City. And they uh, said they would, you know, send that to them. Well, the story now ends because it never got here, or if it got here, we can't locate it now. But I have very strong feelings that it will be found. Now, if this was the cross that Sister Greta told them to, to make and to go bring it into New Mexico to the Pueblos, I think that's what might have gotten the, inter the interest of Friar Benavides to make his trip to Spain. Uh, that's Next. really about all I have. Um, I wanted you to show the, so this is the group that went. Oh, this is the group that uh, went, came, came with Martha. Okay. Next. On my, again. I can oh, see it, again. yeah, I can see. There's the pectoglyphs there, and this is the one with this little, there's like a circle, and rays come down this way. Okay, that wasn't. We I have perfect. I have people back there in the back that could probably clarify this more. And then there were other uh, uh, other vector lips. I don't know what the next picture is. Um, so we wanted to compare it. To oh, that's the one from San Angelo. Is on the far. On your far left, and with the colors there, you can see the color. You can kind of see that same image there as you would see in this pectoral lab. Yeah. Okay. It didn't take much to get my curiosity going. Okay. And there's any other pictures? Thank you. <laughs> Muchísimas, muchísimas gracias por eso de arte importante de arqueología. Nosotros en San Ángelo hemos visto otras cosas que son testimonios de, de esta filosofía. Nosotros hemos visto que ahora la iglesia siempre mira muy mal ¿no? eh, las apariciones, los fenómenos, también el mar de patrocinio, de Sorazo, de María Ángel Jesús Torres, de la librería de, de, de Puebla, eh, que son siempre de los pobres de la iglesia. Y eh, esos son de fundamento astrológico. Nosotros también, en forma de la Inmaculada Concepción, sabemos que tenemos datos arqueológicos en Jerusalén, en la Casa de María, en Jerusalén. Por eso la Iglesia mira, necesita el fundamento arqueológico. Y aquí hemos visto que hay esta presencia. 
una presenza che lo stendio non solo ha eh, regalato mantenendo il primo un recuerdo però egli la tiene viva in sua vita e da parte è uno dei segni de los humanos darà un testimonio di quella che sta verità che lo tiene il Signore. Muchísimas gracias.